Welcome everybody again to another episode of the Idea Me Show, the show that profiles the humans behind the really big ideas that are shaping our world, inspiring the future and future creators. And for all those like really great stories, I'm Ira Pastor, your health, aging, and longevity ambassador along for this journey. Uh, so here we are, it's 2019. Um, we are now spending over $7 trillion around the globe on healthcare, uh, about a trillion of that going to pharmaceutical products, 250 billion or so to medical devices, 200 billion to new life science R&D, and, and on and on and on. And it, the really staggering numbers. And, and we tend to forget how much consolidation has occurred in various segments of this industry. Uh, the world's 10 largest pharmaceutical companies account for about 60% of that trillion dollars a year. Um, here in the United States, the top eight insurance companies control over 50% of all individual coverage. And I read a really interesting fact when I was getting ready for this discussion that in 43 countries around the world, which account for something like three quarters of the world's population, primary care physician appointment times are between five and 10 minutes. <laughs> Amazing. Um, as patients, you know, we know what it's like to feel somewhat separated and significant in this system. Uh, and as we usually talk about it on this show, when we talk about the future and all the amazing stuff that is coming in terms of technology and products and so forth, um, whether it's regeneration or radical life extension and so forth, you know, how can we as individuals ultimately and patients put ourselves back in the driver's seat and not just be another afterthought in this equation? Uh, so today's guest, who knows quite a, a lot about this and, and a lot about other things, uh, is Robin farman -Faramian. Robin is a medical futurist, entrepreneur, best-selling author, and professional speaker, and focuses on the future of integrated medicine, the changing role of patients in healthcare decision-making, and ultimately how technology is really going to change the way we experience, interact with medical facilities and physicians. Uh, she's interested in all sorts of things big data, wearable technologies, 3D printing, access to and the usability of personal healthcare information. Uh, she's the author of a couple of great books, The Patient is CEO, How Technology Empowers the Healthcare Consumer, which is a, an educational tool and resource for healthcare professionals and tech industry and patients as well. Uh, and also uh, the thought leader formula, strategically leveraging your expertise to drive business and career goals. Uh, Robin has worked or is currently working with about a dozen different biotech and biomedicine startup companies. She's currently the CEO and co-founder of a really cool company called Applied Relay Overlay, Reality Overlays, or ARO, ARO, which has developed really neat technologies for corrective eyewear that ultimately will dynamically correct and maintain vision in real time without the need to obtain eyewear every time a prescription gets changed. They do a bunch of other cool things as well. Uh, she served as the COO of Arc Fusion programs, which put you on a variety of events in the area of sort of the uh, fusion of health science and IT. She was the VP at Invicta Medical, which is a sleep apnea and post-anesthesia acute care company, a co-founder and board director of the Oregon Preservation Alliance. Uh, she's involved in a, a variety of other activities. She's on the adjunct faculty and conference advisory board and founding executive producer for the Exponential Medicine Program at Singularity University. Uh, she's an avid philanthropist in her community, a trustee, and a member of the board of directors for the San Francisco Ballet, a volunteer coordinator for San Francisco Upper Bravo Club, and a member of the advisory council, and has contributed time to many other charities. Uh, she's on the advisory board of V2 Ventures, the advisory board of uh, Alacrity, which is a patient services startup company, advisory board of Doctella, Impact Pediatric Health, the advisory board of ARP Health Innovation. I, I could go on and on for an hour. Uh, that being said, Robin, thanks. <laughs> thanks so much for coming on the show today. I, I, I didn't even know my own bio that well. <laughs> <laughs> it took, that it took some time, but I, I tried to keep it under an hour. <laughs> <laughs> That was wonderful. Thank you. I'm, I'm so excited to be here today. Okay. Thank, thank, thanks for taking the time. So um, could you just, we typically on the show just give the, our guests the floor at the beginning to basically go into you, sort of who you are, your background, where you grew up, how you got interested in sort of this convergent area of health, science, information technologies, and are really at the forefront of sort of awareness and, and moving this whole space forward in terms of as you say in your book, giving the, the patient back the power again. Exactly. Um, so my life goal is to impact a minimum of 100 million patients worldwide. And I realized in order to do that, I needed to work on the biggest problems, the things that impact you know, a huge number of people. Diabetes, cancer, sleep apnea, vision correction, 
um, the list goes on and on. Some of my investments include inhaled insulin and a vaccine for herpes, which impacts a huge number of people around the world. Mm -hmm. And I realized in order to be able to do this in disruptive technology, it really is about the convergence of a lot of these different things coming together. And so, for example, the new company I'm working with, Aero, we are converging augmented reality, which is artificial intelligence, of course, with nanotechnology, with cameras, right, with uh, graphene. We're using some of the cutting edge, not the most cutting edge stuff, because that is difficult to you know, commercialize, but mm -hmm. some of like the near cutting edge technologies really coming together to be able to do what we're able to do now. Because something like dynamic vision correction, which is what we're working on, was not possible six years ago. Technologies hadn't converged to that aspect yet. You give a lot of talks and you're, you're a very you know, vocal uh, proponent of, of these technologies and creating awareness. And, and I've, I've watched a lot of your, uh, your talks and, and you give a very uh, sort of this personalized um, story about yourself, you know, at a very young age where there was this sort of misdiagnosis uh, with yourself, which led to, you know, a series of you know, dozens of surgeries and hospitalizations, sort of bring you to the realization that, you know, this wonderful system, which we spent trillions of dollars on, there's problems with it. Uh, can you speak a little bit to that, just to that part of your story, which I think is really fascinating, and then all basically how that fed into you writing sort of the patient and CEO, and I guess some of your, obviously people go out and get the book, but some of your sort of your, your core findings and, and, and things that you like to tell people about that experience and then sort of, you know, how that's directed you. Sure, so yeah, so I was misdiagnosed at a very young age. I was 16. By the age of 26, I'd already had over 40 hospitalizations and six major surgeries, including taking out my entire large intestine. And it turned out they were wrong. And so at the age of 26, when I was on very high dose opioids, I finally said, no, this, there's something wrong. My doctors are all wrong. I'm just gonna fire my entire healthcare team and start from scratch. And that is what I did. And I got off all of the opioids. I ended up getting diagnosed correctly. And the second I got diagnosed correctly, I was put on a biologic medication called Remicade. And I went into remission within 24 hours. Mm. And so the surgeries were not necessary. The number of hospitalizations and the number of life-threatening emergencies I'd had because of the surgeries were not actually required, right? These, these were mistakes. And so when I realized that it's really about the patient having to take control, our expectations are mismatched, right? As a patient, we expect the doctor or the healthcare system to take care of us like we were taken care of by our children, like when we were children or by the educational school system. This is what you do and you're gonna be okay. And it doesn't work that way. They don't have time to do that for you. They've got five or 10 minutes, as you mentioned, although there are some uh, big innovations I'll mention a little bit later going on in that area. But they don't have very much time and they've got how many patients every day, right? It's not anyone else's job but yourself to actually take care of your healthcare. And so becoming the CEO of your healthcare team does not mean you should be knowledgeable about medicine, right? It means you need to be knowledgeable about yourself, mm. how you feel, and the way you want to live your life, right? And then you build your team, your doctors, your nurses, your pharmacists, um, anyone on the healthcare team from chiropractors to massage therapists, these are on your team, but you are the one in control. You are the one who's the CEO. You need to be the one who follows up. You need to be the one who searches for answers if you're not getting it in the right place. Mm -hmm. And you have to understand, doctors are humans, and they are not infallible. There are over 10,000 known human diseases. Do you think that they can figure out what's wrong with you in five minutes? It's not humanly possible, right? And so it is your job as the patient to take control and build the right team around you and then take their advice. If you trust them, do what they're telling you to do. You spoke briefly about Arrow, and I know that's, I guess, one of your, your more recent uh, investments and you've gotten involved uh, as, as the CEO. You're also the, the, one of the founders. Um, and it's a very interesting, I, I, obviously I can't speak to it. I'd love to hear more from you. It's, but it's a very, once again, one of those very interesting uh, convergent stories. You know, a lot of times on this show, we've had people on, for instance, from uh, some, from NASA talking about, uh, you know, how stuff up there ultimately is going to trickle down to, you know, whether it's 
why we age faster in space, we will learn interesting things about aging on Earth and so forth. That. In, in this particular case with Arrow, you know, you seem like you've, you know, you've gone beyond healthcare. You've sort of interfaced with some uh, special forces people and uh, uh, people in the military. Where obviously the concept of you know having glasses that and go from light to dark or uh, can see through <laughs> walls or wh whatever the purpose yeah. is. So the military obviously are going to have a lot of. Um, you know, I've been wearing glasses, I don't know now, but I've been wearing glasses since I was 10 years old. I was like, wow, that'd be really cool if I had something like that back in the 80s, as opposed to the giant things <laughs> I was wearing. Tell us just a little bit about your journey with Arrow, because it's a really fascinating story. And you can just go to the background of how you decided to put that together. It's really neat. Sure. So I've actually been actively looking for technology to be able to pull out of the military. Mm -hmm. Because most of the biggest innovations are coming out of things like DARPA or ARPA before, you know, with mm -hmm. the internet. And so I've been actively looking and I wasn't looking down this route with my co-founders in this particular one, but they ended up coming to me. I met one of them about five years ago and we just stayed friends. And then all of a sudden he's like, all right, you know what? Uh, I think the technology is there on the consumer side. We can get this done. He put together a team of 13 or 14 of us and uh, asked me to be the CEO. So we're, we are ready to go and we are just raising our first round. Mm -hmm. Now, let me tell you a little bit about the product though. So Please. what it is, is dynamic vision correction. These are glasses, just like you would wear a pair of sunglasses. And if you've seen the Bose sunglasses that have the um, sound in the, mm -hmm. sure. in the, yeah. So if you've seen those, they're amazing and they're super light. And so we're going to look, you know, more like regular eyeglasses. They're not going to be big, bulky, augmented reality glasses. And instead of trying to put an augmented reality spin on it, what we're actually doing is we're going to be able to tell we, where you are looking, where you are focusing by video cameras. So we have video cameras facing out, we have video cameras, cameras facing in, and they know exactly where you are looking at every single second. And as soon as they know where you're looking, they're going to dynamically adjust that in real time. So, which means it's not just replacing your readers or your bifocals or your trifocals. It is also telescopic, right? Mm -hmm. it's, uh, magnifying. You can actually have better vision than 2020 with these. And because we've got a photochromatic lens on it, just like transition lenses, when you walk outside or it gets too bright, it mm -hmm. will darken for you automatically. Mm -hmm. So we're going to replace anything from a reader to a bifocal to even going to the optometrist because it no longer matters what your vision is. Mm -hmm. It only matters, um, like it doesn't matter if you're 2040, we are just going to adjust it in real time. <laughs> Amazing. You're going to shake up a lot. Uh, yep. It's uh, clearly transformational and, and, and really inspiring. Um, if you think about it, it's the last thing that we use on a daily basis that hasn't been digitized at all. It's right. not in our smartphones. Nope. nope. And, and so there's the innovation on that, but then I want to talk to you a little bit about the software side because I think you will sure. understand this and your, your audience is sophisticated enough to understand this. Sure. The reason we're able to do this and not have the side effects like nausea and vertical that you have in typical XR, whether it's VR, MR, or AR, Okay. Is because we realize the few companies that are building the foundational software, not the applications, which most people are building the applications, but that foundational software layer, they didn't build in physics. Ah. And that came as a huge shock to us. These other companies, what they're doing is they're showing the same image to both eyes at the same time. Hmm. But your eyes do not see an object in motion at the same time. They see it at different times. And it's easy to take that into account in the world of XR. All you do is use a basic physics equation, which we now locked up the IP around. Mm. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes. But that's all it is. And so that's going to dramatically fix all of those side effects, regardless of what platform you're using. And we'll be able to get that out to the world with licensing or white labeling or what have you. Very cool, very cool, amazing, amazing story. Um, it, it may, you know, we were we were speaking before about, you know, once again the um, all these very interesting uh, technologies and stuff. start out in the military and ultimately make their way. And it was a, I was actually on a DARPA 
uh, one of those RFP conference calls a few months ago where we were talking about suspended animation and sort of this golden hour uh, in, the, in the war zone where people either bleed to death or if there's the right technologies, we can you know, keep tissues alive and viable. And you know, it made me think obviously about your, your uh, you know, been very active with the Oregon Preservation Alliance. And this is something that, you know, on previous shows we talked about uh, tools in terms of organ bioengineering, bioprinting, things of this nature. But, you know, I guess what a lot of people don't realize that, you know, of that tremendous amount of um, people that are waiting, you know, you see these organ lists that, you know, have 90,000 people waiting for kidneys and, and 5,000 for livers and hearts and things of this nature. But, you know, aside from creating new organs, there is this gap that exists in terms of how we keep these organs a lot, you know, viable uh, instead of, I forget what the times are, but instead of 24 hours, if we could extend it for a longer period of time, it increases dramatically the amount of potential transplants. Can you tell us a little bit about what you're doing with the Organ Preservation Alliance, uh, what's going on there in terms of you know, research, discoveries, and so forth? Sure. So I'm not actively involved anymore because now I'm working with Arrow, but I am one of the early co-founders and I was executive director and then on the BOD for a while. Uh, so let me tell you a little bit about the company. We sure. started initially because we realized that there hadn't been even an event for all the cryobiologists in the world. Mm -hmm. They were thinking it was a 35-year-out problem that we would not be able to cryopreserve individual vascularized organs for at least three decades. Mm -hmm. And so we decided we got the community together. Uh, we did that by scraping the white papers and just identifying anyone who's written anything on cryobiology got them all in the room together, educated them on what everyone else was doing, and mm -hmm. had a workshop both at DARPA and at the um, OSTP, so the Office of Science and Technology Policy. So we got to run these events at the White House. We had everyone in the room from the FDA to the NIH. And um, we really came up with a roadmap by creating that community where it was a step-by-step six-stage engineering process to actually have successful cryopreservation. Mm -hmm. And so we brought down the average from over three decades to thinking we're going to solve this within the next 10 years. Not only that, but there's been some massive innovation. Uh, one of the startups that was working with the community, and I won't say their name yet because they haven't given me permission, sure. but uh, they have managed to solve uh, one of the big problems, which is when you freeze an organ, it's actually more dangerous when you rewarm it. When you rewarm the organ, that's when ice crystals form and they break through the cell walls sure. and it destroys the organ. So they have come up with a non-toxic molecule mm -hmm. that rounds out those, those sharp edges of the ice crystals. And that right there is a game changer because the other problem is that these molecules that are usually used for things like cryopreservation are toxic in large doses. So this is a non-toxic molecule, and that solves two of the major problems, and they've already transplanted a number of mouse hearts successfully Absolutely. after cryopreserving them for 24 hours. That is a big deal, because while you said, you know, there's, there's tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people on the transplant list, mm -hmm. in fact, in the United States, more than 700,000 people die a year from organ failure. Yep. They're not even on the list. That yep. is something that is a crazy high number, right? Because heart disease is fixable with a heart transplant, but you don't normally go and get a heart transplant for just regular heart disease. And so that's a game changer. Absolutely. There's so many other inventions and technologies you're involved with um, in biotech. You know, looking out the next five, 10 years, are there other things that you want to that you're most excited about obviously there's things you can't talk about yet but other things you want to talk about on the show because i i could go into many of them but where do you, you you i'm gonna give you back the floor for a little bit um specific things that you you're going to announce that you want to <laughs> that you, that are ready to be announced or other projects that you have on the biomedical front you want to talk about well there there is some stuff that most people don't end up learning about that that has nothing to do with technology per se but more of adoption and how we're getting these distributed. Okay. And I, I happen to have United Healthcare happens to be my insurance company for the past five or six years or so. Mm -hmm. And I also gave a talk for United Healthcare and I get to, got to meet a lot of their C-suite. And I am off the charts impressed on how quickly they are adopting some of these technologies and they are trying to push through some of these massive initiatives that are going to slice the cost of healthcare. 
And so one of the things that I just got in the mail, um, a letter saying they now, once a year, for free, will send a doctor to my house to sit down with me for one hour. <laughs> Wait a second. You want to give me a free appointment in my apartment around my schedule with a physician once a year just to catch up and make sure I'm doing well. There you go. That is huge. Secondly, they were the first insurance company that reimbursed Heal, which I've been using for a while. And Heal sends a doctor and a nurse to your house to do a flu shot for you, essentially on demand. I made an appointment like the night before for like noon the next day when I did it last year, but um, it was a zero dollar copay and they came into my apartment at noon. Five minutes later, they were gone. I had a free flu shot and United was one of the big people on top of that one as well, pushing that through. But the other one of the initiatives that I'm really excited about with them is they are massively pushing telemedicine. And the reason they're able to push both behavioral telemedicine, so they have a huge number of thousands of providers now across the country. And I don't work for United, so I mean, I'm just very happy that this is getting out there. Sure. But in addition, they understand some of these point of care diagnostics. So you, if you haven't seen some of the point of care diagnostics recently, take another look. So Title Care, this is an Israeli company and they're distributing now through Best Buy and it is for devices. Hmm. And they all come with video cameras, so you know, you hook them up. And what you do is, it, is uh, through video, you have a doctor's appointment on demand. So you call up the doctor and she walks you through using these four medical devices on yourself or on say your child or spouse hmm. or whoever you're with. It's a stethoscope, an otoscope, which is what looks in the ear. Um, a tongue depressor so they can look down the throat for things like stuff, strep throat and sore mm -hmm. throat, as well as, um, I said stethoscope, there's, there's four. Oh, um, blood pressure monitor, sorry, CP. And so between those four, you've just done a checkup on, with a pediatrician or with your primary care and you've avoided going into the doctor's office and that can be helpful for, for you know, regular things like flu and strep and all of that because, you know, you've just had a full physical through the computer. Definitely. And so not only are they reimbursing for those kinds of things, but you know, title care, it's like $300 at Best Buy and it comes with the entire system. Huh. Like it's, it's crazy accessible. So if you have three kids under the age of 10, get this, you know what I mean? Like how much money and time is that gonna save you? <laughs> Amazing. I mean, I have, to, I, have to, I have to check that one out. I, I don't want to do the tongue depressor thing because they'll always, I have three kids actually, they always gag whenever that part comes. I'll, I'll let the doctor do that one. But I see the rest of it. That's pretty cool. Oh, with, by the way, with the tongue depressor and how cool it is, is that the video camera on the tongue depressor, the doctor is the one who sees the camera feed. Ah, neat. Right? So it's as if she is actually looking down at it. That's really cool amazing uh, set of things you're involved in um, it, it's just really uh, and, you, and you speak so passionently about it and um, it, it's just great seeing folks like you lead uh, once again the, the process here and generating awareness about all this stuff because there's just so much that happens and many people aren't aware of one of the things we do this show is try to, <laughs> to bring awareness to it all but you really uh, you do it on hyperdrive which is really exciting um, Robert, what um, yeah, you got a couple, a couple of personal questions we typically do on the show, but um, influencers, um, people that sort of guided you along your way at the very beginning, uh, you know, if they weren't there, you would have done something totally different with your life. Uh, anyone you want to shout out to on that front? Well, my dad. My dad is an MIT scientist turned patent attorney. So ah. he has lived on the forefront of innovation his entire career. And uh, my mom was a pediatrician, one of three women in her entire medical school at the time. Excellent. So kind of like the pioneering women. And then Ray Kurzweil, he is my, one of my very best friends and my mentor for, oh gosh, eight or nine, ten years now. And um, he is, I mean, you can tell with my books and my speeches that a lot of, it's very Kurzweilian. <laughs> There's a lot to do with AI and, and all of that stuff. So he was a really big influence in my content. It would probably be pretty cool having Ray Kurzweil as a friend. <laughs> yes, it's very awesome. <laughs>
So one other question along these lines, and here we get a little bit more into the science fiction, but we give this to everyone that comes on the show. Um, obviously, you met a lot of fascinating people in your, in your career to date and, and throughout your life. Um, this question is about the ones that you obviously wouldn't have had the chance to meet, but if I was to give you a ride in my time machine that's sitting over here. Uh, Robin, Farman Faramian, where would you go uh, in time, uh, to, and who would you go seek out to talk to? Uh, it doesn't have to be a scientist, it be a philosopher, artist, uh, whomever, but... No, I mean, it would, it, it would probably be Einstein <laughs> and then uh, Da Vinci. Okay. Right? Those two. Because their, their work and their ideas are really the foundation of the innovation we're working on now. <laughs> right? without, without them, we wouldn't be as far as we are today. So yeah, probably those two. Yeah, no, they're 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 great. I I'm I'm sort of laughing myself. I have over here on the bookshelf. I have a a book called Learning from Leonardo, which uh, I, I actually I read it. Uh, I tried. I've gone through it a few times, and it's yeah. I mean that that one's fascinating just to think. But five hundred years ago, when there was no internet, and there was no TV, and it came up with these thoughts and ideas, right. and it's just. I show that to my kids all the time to say, look, you, know, you just get off the internet and just think for a little bit. You can come up with some really cool stuff. Yes. Um, Robin, it, it's, uh, it's really been such a pleasure and honor having you come on the show today. You, you're truly, uh, you have amazing ideas. And, and as we say on the show, you're really, you're moving this, the human story forward. And it, it's just really fascinating. I just want to thank you for everything uh, that you do. Uh, and once again, for everyone that's listening and going to be watching, uh, Robin Farmanteramian, medical futurist, entrepreneur, best-selling author, professional speaker. Uh, go pick up her book, The Patient is CEO, How Technology Empowers the Healthcare and Consumer, and check out all her companies and investments and all the things she's involved in. She's, she's living the biotech entrepreneur life of a hundred of us, but uh, really uh, thank you again for your time and thank you so much for everything you do. Sure, thank you for having me. It's been wonderful.